This is the story of a bird and the people who love it. The wood thrush spends its summers breeding in woodland areas throughout the eastern United States. We met with Forsyth Audubon, a chapter in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, to hear the story of their wood thrush project. So tell me about how we're going to find this location and, and find the location where the wood thrush came back okay, to. These are all the locations of all the birds. Okay, and this is the particular one that was recaptured um, and we have the GPS coordinates of that. So we're going to head toward the GPS coordinates for that bird. They researched with scientists from the Smithsonian's Migratory Connectivity Project, along with Audubon North Carolina, the National Audubon Society, and the Audubon International Alliances Program. A tiny new state-of-the-art technology could possibly provide the GPS data needed to show the route of the wood thrush's migration and exactly what habitats and important bird areas they're depending on. So we're standing on a ridge between the initial capture location, which was over on that ridge. We had a set of nets downhill there and a set going diagonally up the ridge. And then in 2015, we caught, recaptured the birds up on this ridge behind us, um, again with multiple net sets and playback, but it was the first net run of the morning that we caught the bird. <laughs> really kind of amazing. <laughs> the geolocator backpack and migration data were intact. They discovered the wood thrush had journeyed over 3,000 miles, round trip from North Carolina to the small Caribbean nation of Belize, and back to the same exact location in Pilot Mountain the following spring. So we traveled with Kim Brand of Forsyth Audubon and Audubon North Carolina to explore this connection. Our wood thrush was just about two to three kilometers actually northwest from where we are in very similar habitat to this all dense broadleaf forest. Nice. So in that right over there, our wood thrush spent all of last winter. Yeah. Wow, banned in North Carolina. And spent Came the all the way here in Belize. <laughs> to you <laughs> in yes. your backyard and made it all the way back to North Carolina. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. Mm -hmm. These birds make these amazing journeys, hundreds of miles every year, to return back to Belize to share this habitat. Those stories are important. It's not just a bird you see flying around. It's an amazing creature that's able to do that journey and come back. We need to ensure that their habitat is here. It's protected. Animals don't have boundaries. Animals go from North America to Central America to South America, and it's where the habitats are. The experience we had with Forsyth really showed the connectivity, but it also helped people to really make the connectivity. And that from a conservation point of view, you can't have just one group doing their work. We have to do it holistically. The way climate change works on a bird is kind of at the individual level. We often think of birds that are vulnerable to climate change is having to kind of pick up and move. Actually, for a lot of our land birds, that's not how it works. You know, the bird tries to stay where he was born, where he's been raising young. Woodthrush can live to be 10 or 12 years old in the wild, and they do come back to the same places year after year. The food that they depend on gets stressed, reduces. The forest that they depend on is stressed. What happens is that individual bird, that, that male and female that are trying to raise babies, aren't as successful. And so if you look at those maps a lot of times, you start out with this dense yellow and it becomes just this kind of pale yellow as all the birds kind of wink out of that space. So to me, that's why it's really important to work to make the habitat that we've got just as productive as it can possibly be. You know, protect the forest, make the forest as resilient as possible to climate change, and that makes the wood thrush and other forest birds as resilient to climate change as possible. It's lost 60% uh, of its uh, population over the last 40 years. Now that's uh, an alarm bell that's going off in a lot of people's minds. 
the birds really put it into focus in terms of the fact that the problems we are facing are everywhere. Habitat destruction, climate change, impacts to protected areas, all of them are being experienced globally and I think the birds are messengers. It's like a bird speaking to us telling us, hey, something is wrong, you know? We can take action starting in our own backyards by growing native plants. Protecting our forests is the first step towards full life cycle conservation. With a sort of a bipartisan support, uh, we could really create um, the situations, I guess, the, the recipe for um, keeping a lot of what we see today around so that our future generations can experience it. Farmers are welcoming birds and pollinators on their farms. Around the world, bird guide trainings and education programs are creating opportunities. Okay, if you can see up there. The head of our education department, she goes out and she talks with the corporations around about certain things about climate change and the Lights Out program. She also talks to the young folks, which I think is one of the key things that we have to do as the ambassadors for Audubon. We need to get more young folks involved because we need to pass the torch to them. The Climate Listening Project learned how we can all work together to protect the birds we love. Thank you.